Hello, everyone. Uh, it's been a frustrating day. Uh, I recorded this video once already, and uh, it went great, actually. And I made some hilarious Star Wars reference slash jokes, and uh, you know, I really nailed the explanations on everything. But about 10 minutes in, a car alarm went off, and I paused the video for your sakes. And then when I unpaused, I forgot to reactivate my screen sharing. Um, so the screen didn't record. <laughs> so it's just my voice for like an hour talking to a black screen. So here we go again. So we're covering section 14.7 in this video, which is extreme values. And I think in the uh, textbook they call it maximum and minimum values so that's what extreme values are maximums and minimums uh, so we talked about this in um, calc 1 uh, and in calc 1 we had a nice a nice way to um, find the locations of these maximums and uh, we had this this tool called the second derivative test okay so we should uh, go ahead and distinguish between what a uh, absolute maximum is and a local maximum. Okay. So let's first talk about local maximums and minimums, these local extreme values. Okay. I have a, uh, well, the way I think about maximum or local max and mins is um, local minimums are like the the bottoms of my values. So like here at this point A, okay? We have a local minimum at this uh, this point A. Why do we call it a local minimum? Because if I draw, if I like consider like a little area around A, okay? In other words, I kind of consider this bubble around this point here. All right, my my point here, the bottom of my trough, is it's the, the minimum in that little neighborhood, okay? If, if that, that uh, area gets, you know, if that bubble gets too big, maybe it's no longer a minimum, right? So like if I widen my bu bubble to include that, okay, well, there's points smaller over here, okay? But if I draw a small enough uh, bubble around that point, um, we have a, a minimum at A. So that's why we call it a local minimum. Okay, and we can have multiple local minimums. For instance, here at this point, let's call it C. We have another local minimum, right? Uh, another little valley here. And then local maximums are uh, the kind of tops of our mountains. So we have, again, a local, minim um, local maximum here at this point because I can draw a little bubble around this, this point and uh, this, this is the maximum in that little bubble. Okay, so those are uh, local minimums and maximums. Um, what's an extreme, or excuse me, an absolute uh, minimum and maximum? Okay. Okay, that's usually that usually occurs on uh, bounded uh, intervals. You know, we don't so we don't have a we don't have a we don't have a domain that's going off to infinity in both directions, meaning, okay, my, my function is kind of restricted to this bounded domain here, and let's call it D, okay? So instead of considering this function F from R to R, let's just kind of restrict ourselves to um, F D to R, where this D is, you know, some bounded interval, okay? What would uh, absolute maximum be? The absolute maximum is kind of what you, maybe more intuitively think of as maximums. It's the, the largest value in uh, on that domain, okay? So in here we have, um, you know, we have a local maximum here, but then let's say these, you know, these two points are equal, okay? So these two kind of n, there's two values that are endpoints are equal. Okay, well then those would be the absolute maximums. Okay, and maybe maybe I only have, maybe they're not equal. Maybe this one's a little bit lower. Okay, so then this value here at this endpoint is the absolute maximum. Okay, now uh, why do we distinguish between those two? Okay, if you think back to Calc 1, um, 
the second derivative test, et cetera. That, that kind of stuff, those techniques were useful for finding local minimums and maximums, but not really for global stuff. So for the local, uh, for the uh, second derivative test, uh, the methods we use uh, that go along with the second derivative test, that tells us what's happening on the inside of our domain, okay? On the interior of our domain D. Uh, but it doesn't really tell us anything about what's going on on the endpoints, okay? The idea is, okay, uh, if, I, if I'm determining whether this, there's a, a maximum here, like, like let's say I'm investigating this point B, if I'm using the second derivative test and all that, I have to be able to draw that little bubble around B and have points on both sides of B. Okay. Now on that, on these endpoints, you know, I can't, I can't do that. Okay. Cause there's nothing, there's nothing out here on this side of the bubble, right? It's, it's kind of a one-sided uh, thing on these endpoints. So uh, our second derivative test can only tell us what's going on on the inside of these intervals. Okay. Um, and maybe you don't even remember what the second derivative test really is. Don't worry about that. We're going to kind of reconstruct it as we go and then show how it um, scales up to higher dimensions. Okay, so I'm just mentioning here. So we're going to develop the, the idea is that we have this um, just a quick overview of what the second derivative test is, right? Uh, for a single variable, what did we do in Calc 1? We found all the points. So this is like our function, this is a graph of our function f, right? We started by finding all the points where f, the first derivative of, of f, f prime. We started by finding where f prime is equal to zero and we called these things the critical points. These are possible locations of maximum and minimum values, okay? They're not all gonna be maxes and mins, maybe none of them are, but, um, these are the possible maxes and mins. And then we used, once we had that kind of group of points, we conducted our second derivative test and that tells us exactly which ones are maxes and mins. Okay, so that's the idea. Um, we're gonna develop a similar machinery for um, multivariable functions. Okay, so that's, that's what our goal is. So let's, let's start developing this machinery okay so uh going going back to calc one for a second let's look at this maximum here as i said okay this is a local maximum what's going on with the derivative of f there we said uh this is going to be a critical point right all the maximums and minimums occur at critical points but not all critical points are maxes or minimums so this, this uh, value a, at that value a, f prime of a is equal to zero. And that kind of makes sense, right? Our, our tangent has to be horizontal here for us to have a maximum. Because what's going on? Our function's increasing, 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 and then it's kind of leveling off, and then it's going back down. So it's like our, our, our slope is positive. We're, we're gaining altitude, if you want to think about it that way. And then at the maximum, we kind of at our maximum, we hit our peak, and then from there, it's all downhill, okay? So that's the idea. And uh, so the only way to have a maximum, a local maximum, is for that derivative to be zero at the peak. And then the same thing for local minimums, okay? I'm, go I'm decreasing, I'm decreasing my slopes negative. At here, it levels off, and then it starts increasing again. Okay, so at these, at both maximums and minimums, my derivatives are zero. Okay, and then I have a, as you can see, I've already gone through the video once and I've got all my kind of sketching left over. So we have a, a similar uh, idea for multivariable functions. Okay, so let's say this is our multivariable function, okay? And as you can kind of see it, uh, what it's intended to look like is kind of a mount, uh, 
uh, a multivariable, uh, a function from R2 to R. And it kind of, I'm trying to draw like a mountain top type here, mountain top kind of thing. So we can see there's like a peak of a mountain right here. Okay, so the, um, we, that's clearly a maximum, right? And we have a, a similar concept from our, uh, the single variable case, okay? Um, at this peak, uh, my derivatives, my partial derivatives all have to be zero. Right, because if I kind of if I kind of think about taking a slice out of this function, let's say I take a slice parallel to that x-axis and kind of lay it flat on the page. Okay, maybe my curve in that slice would look like that. And then on that single in that in that slice, I can treat the slice as a single variable case, right? And so that derivative right there should be zero. Okay, so this this tangent line here. Um, should be horizontal in that slice. Uh, so that what is that slice? It's we could that would kind of give us our um, partial derivative with respect to x, right? So f(x). So we expect f(x) is equal to zero. Uh, let's say this this maximum is occurring at the point a in the domain. Uh, a, B, let's call it, okay. So we expect F of X at A, B is equal to zero, okay. And um, then we, we get a similar uh, concept for the partial derivative with respect to Y in the Y direction. So I draw a tangent line in the Y direction. And again, I expect that slope to be zero. So F, Y of A, B should also equal to zero. And not just for the partial derivatives, but also for the uh, directional derivatives, which you talked about in the last video, right? No matter what, um, no matter what direction I draw a derivative in, okay? And uh, if I take a kind of a 2D slice like this, uh, it's gonna be a maximum in this kind of slice. So that we expect that derivative to be zero just from my single variable, uh, use of the second derivative test. So um, we expect all these tangent lines at these points uh, to have zero slope. So all our derivatives should be zero. And then if our function's nice enough, uh, and by nice enough, I mean what? Uh, differentiable, um, continuous, second order partial derivatives. Okay, that's kind of a technicality, so don't worry about that too much. What I'm saying is if our, if our function's nicely behaved as almost 100% of the functions in this class are, um, we're gonna have a tangent plane, not just a bunch of uh, derivatives, not a, just a bunch of tangent lines, but all those tangent lines come together and form this tangent plane, okay? And that tangent plane is gonna be horizontal, right? It's made up of all these derivatives that are horizontal, and so this tangent plane is also horizontal. So parallel to that x, y axis. Okay, um, so this is just kind of reiterating what we had here, what I had already said. So our tangent plane is horizontal. Now, the, uh, as I said, if F is uh, differentiable, what is what is the tangent plane ho being horizontal mean? Well, it's enough to say that our, our um, gradient is uh, uh, all zeros. So what is, remember what the gradient is. The gradient is that vector. Okay, remember a gradient of F is equal to the vector made up of the partial derivatives. So if I had like a function of X and Y, the gradient is FX, FY. If I had a function of, uh, that should be a y there. If I had a function of f x1 to xn, right? A gradient is partial derivative with respect to x1 all the way to partial derivative with respect to xn. Now, <clears throat> saying that the gradient is equal to the zero vector which I've written here, is kind of like saying, and, and it's kind of our direct analog, it's, it's, a, uh, it's like saying 
the first derivative is equal to zero in the single variable case. Okay, so my gradient, my vector, um, so I see at these maximums and minimums, I still have the same criteria where uh, the derivatives all have to be zero there, okay? So this is kind of giving us a, a way to narrow down where my maximum and minimums occur. I'm gonna start by looking for all the points X where my gradient is equal to zero. So that's that's where uh, that's uh, those points where the gradient is equal to zero. Again, I want to call those critical points, just like in the single variable case. Okay, when those those points where um, the first where the derivative is equal to zero, we call those critical points. Now, when uh, my gradient is equal to zero, uh, I'm going to call those vectors critical points. But remember that uh, critical points do not guarantee that we have a maximum or minimum. I've already stated that, but let's kind of see an example. So if you consider the point, or excuse me, the function f of x equals x cubed, uh, what's, what's the derivative? Okay, the derivative would be this, uh, 3x squared. Where is this derivative zero? Well, that derivative is only z equal to zero when x is equal to zero, okay? But at x equals to zero, yeah, our derivative is equal to zero. But um, at x equals to zero, do we have a maximum or a minimum? Uh, a local max or a local min? No, we don't, right? No matter how small a bubble I draw around this point, there's always gonna be a, po uh, a point um, bigger than x on my graph and a point smaller than x on my graph. Okay, so this, this point right here in the middle, that, that's never a maximum or a minimum. So, we, you know, this is, like I said, this is still a critical point, but it's obviously not a max or a min. Okay. And then, let's see, I tried to draw, what I ended up doing was I tried to kind of show you guys, let me see if I can find it, my deleted. I drew this picture, it's probably in here. Yeah, there we go. So this would be a multivariable um, example of a function, uh, a surface where, okay, at that black dot, the partial derivatives might all be equal to zero. Um, so like in the, in, along the green curve, right? That's a, a downward facing parabola. But as I move from the point C to D, okay, I'm increasing, right? So that black dot is kind of at the maximum. It's at the, it's at the top of that mountain. Um, along the c to d curve okay so at that black dot um the the derivatives in the in the direction of c and d we expect those to be zero because it's kind of a, a maximum in that direction but then along the red curve it's a minimum okay so we still expect those partials to be zero along the red curve but uh it's it's a minimum okay so this point um when I consider the function as a whole, it's neither a maximum nor a minimum, right? If I, if I move along the red curve, I'm getting bigger. And if I move along the green curve, I'm gonna be getting smaller as I move away from the black point. So that black point is neither a maximum nor a minimum, but all its partial derivatives in every direction are gonna be equal to zero at that point. So this is kind of like the multivariable uh, example of x cubed. So I wasted a little time in the previous video trying to draw something like that and gave up and found a picture on the internet. All right, so obviously finding these critical points are um, critical. So here's an example. Uh, try it on your, oh, well, I guess I've already written the answer on the screen. But uh, how do we find the critical points? All right, we take our function and we differentiate, uh, we find the partial derivatives, right? We find our gradient vector. So our gradient, um, del f, okay. Well, the derivative with respect to x is negative two x. Derivative with respect to y is just two y. 
Okay, where is this equal to zero, zero? Okay. Well, it's only possible if X and Y are both zero, right? So the critical point here for this uh, curve is zero, zero. Because at zero, zero, um, my gradient is equal to zero. And again, uh, like I said, this, this graph, it's gonna be one of those saddle shapes like what, what I just showed you the picture of. So even though this critical point, um, even though this is a critical point and our gradient is zero there, that uh, function is not gonna have a maximum or a minimum at that uh, point zero, zero. So again, to reiterate, we've seen that critical points do not guarantee an extreme value, but they are, uh, it, if, we have a, if we have a local maximum or a local minimum, um, that is going to be located at a critical point. So as I said before, um, all, all maxes and mins are at critical points, but not all critical points are maxes or mins. Now, for the single variable case, what was our next step? We considered the second derivative. We used the second derivative test. And what was that? Recall, um, uh, we had this, this kind of criteria. Okay, if the first derivative is equal to zero, and then the second derivative is negative, that point is gonna be a maximum. Okay, so if the first derivative is zero, let's say at a point A. Let's talk about specific points A. Okay. So if the first derivative is zero at A, and the second derivative is negative at A, then we have a maximum. If the first derivative is zero and the second derivative is positive, then we're gonna have a minimum. Okay, and again, here we're assuming uh, this, the second derivative is continuous, and that's that's a bit of a technicality. And um, as I said before, our our functions, almost 100% of the functions we're going to deal with in this section and the course at large, are going to have this. But it's it's net it's a bit more than a technicality. It's it, the whole theory kind of hinges on it, but we're not gonna usually ask you to check that the second derivative is continuous. Now, why, why does this criteria work? It might seem like it's coming out of nowhere. Uh, so let's, let's talk about why this um, criteria works for the single variable case. And then once we understand why it works in the single variable case, it's a fairly straightforward extension to the multivariable case. So excuse me for one moment. Okay, back to recording. Unfortunately, with the new way of doing this, uh, my pauses might become more evident. All right, so we were talking about why the second derivative test works, why this criterion works. Okay. Um, now we already discussed the idea that uh, the derivative is really equivalent to the idea of this linear approximation. We talked about that in section 14.5, I believe. So if f is differentiable, okay, we have uh, this equality here. So we have f of x plus h minus f of x equals, and this is for the single variable, var variable case, f prime of x times h plus this error term here, uh, epsilon that depends on x times h. Okay, uh, and then rearranging a little bit, maybe this approximation gets a bit clearer. We have f of x, I, I've just moved the f of x over to the right side. And then we can interpret this second line like this. f of x plus h is approximately equal to this. So this would be a good approximation to f of x plus h when, x, when h is small, okay? So for, for points kind of around x, uh, f of x plus h is equivalent is a is a, approximately equal to f of x plus this derivative times my my change in input. Okay. All right, and then so that's an approx 
uh, approximation. This is an approximation. And then if I include an error term, okay, we can say it's exactly equal. And the, the error term, we have this condition that the limit of error over h as h goes to zero equals zero. Okay. And so this limit also goes to zero. All right. Uh, what that means for the, what, you know, don't worry about that too much. It just means that as H gets smaller, this error term gets smaller, meaning as, as we get closer and closer to this starting point X, our approximation gets more and more accurate. Okay. Um, and we can make this approximation better by adding a second derivative term. Okay. And this is kind of getting into some Calc 2 stuff, maybe like Taylor polynomials and things like that. Um, we can make this approximation better, as I said, by adding a second derivative term here. Okay. So in this case, we have f of x plus h is approximately f of x plus the derivative f prime of x times h plus the second derivative um, times h squared, and then uh, a different error term. Okay, and again, this error term, now this error term, eta x goes to zero as h squared goes to zero. Okay, and so again, this error term goes to zero. Okay, now <clears throat> imagine we have a function Imagine we have our function f, and imagine we have this situation. Imagine we have a critical point at um, a, at a particular value a. Okay. So let's say we have a critical point at x equals a, okay. Which, what does that mean? Remember what that means? It means our first derivative at a is equal to zero, okay. And then also, let's also imagine we have our second derivative at a is greater than zero, okay. Let's see what happens with this approximation here. So let's go ahead and rewrite our approximation, but instead of x, we'll, we'll work on the specific point a. Okay, so our, our uh, approximation with our error term at the point A would look like this, okay? So I have f of A plus H is equal to f of A plus f prime at A times H plus f double prime uh, at A H squared plus that error term eta X H squared, okay? Now, remember we're at a, uh, um, A is a critical point. So this first derivative is gonna be zero. Right, all right, so I'm gonna replace, so let's I'm gonna rewrite this line again for you guys and explain as I go. So let's translate this, let's translate this line here. Okay, so we have f of, uh, f of a plus h, that's fine. And then we have f of a, and then we're at a critical point, so the first derivative is zero. My pen is malfunctioning a bit. Okay, so that first derivative is zero, so that first derivative times h is also zero. And then we have f double prime a h squared. Now, we're assuming that we're at a critical point where the second derivative is positive. Okay, so f double prime, this here is a positive number, and then h squared is gonna be a positive number, right? So let's just write positive number here, okay? And then what is this? Well, um, h squared is positive. This error, eta x, that could be positive or negative. 
so this, this term could be positive or negative, but uh, remember that we said that the limit of eta x as h goes to zero, eta x over h squared, this limit is equal to zero, okay? So if h is small enough, this term will be very small. Okay. So let's call this a small number. Okay. So what do we have? F of a plus h is going to be equal to f of a plus a positive number plus a small number that could be positive or negative. But the key here is that if this is small enough, if this error term is small enough, then this positive number plus that error term is still gonna be positive. So we still have a positive number here if we're close to A. So this is still a positive number, okay? So essentially what we have, and it's not, um, not critical you know, to be specific, but uh, the idea here will be Apologies, the, uh, almost there. Yeah, here we are. The critical uh, idea here is that what we have is f of a plus h is equal to f of a plus a positive number, okay? So what's bigger, f of a or f of a plus h? Okay, well, f of a plus h is bigger. Now, what we've done is uh, not specific to this, this value of h. So what, what we've said is that like, okay, I have this point a, and essentially what I'm doing is I'm picking any point in here and calling it a plus h. a could be positive or negative, you know, if h, or excuse me, h, is, h could be positive or negative. So if uh, h is negative, a plus h is over here. And if H is positive, A plus H is over here. But the idea is I can, you know, for any small point close to A, I can write, write that point close to A as A plus H. Okay. So what we're saying here is that um, if we're close, in, like for any point close So for any point close to A, we can call it A plus H. And then what do we have? We have F of A plus H is equal to F of A plus a positive number. So what does that mean? So F of A plus H must be bigger than f of a, right? Because we're adding a positive number to f of a and we're getting f of a plus h, okay? And that's what I've, uh, that's what I've written here. So for any x, you know, what the, whether you call it x or a plus h, let's call it x. For any x in that neighborhood close to a, we have f of x is gonna be greater than f of a. And it was all, um, all based on, all based on this idea that um, the second derivative is uh, positive. And what does this mean? Uh, you know, we, we, uh, we haven't really translated what this means, but it means that this point f of a is a minimum, right? Okay, why? Okay, so I have this graph, let's say I have a, and I have my point, you know, this, let's call this f of a, so that's the point of my function. And then for any point around a, f of a plus, uh, call it f of a plus h, if we move in any direction, the points are getting bigger, okay? So what does that look like? Well, it must be that that uh, function has a minimum at a, because all the points around it are bigger than it, okay? Okay. So we see f prime 
of a equals zero and f double prime of a greater than zero gives us a minimum, a local minimum. Okay, so we must have a local minimum at that point a. And then similar idea for maximum. We can, you know, you can work through this argument on, on your own and see why, okay, if, if, the, if the derivative is less, the second derivative is less than zero, we're going to have a maximum. All right, so that's again for single variable case, but we have a similar idea for the multivariable case. Um, but to work in the multivariable case, we just need to account for these extra dimensions. So in, I, I think, 14.5 again, um, we worked in this idea of linear approximation for multivariable stuff. Uh, so similar to the single variable case, if F is differentiable in the sense we defined in that section, then I'll know, um, let's say I'm, I'm working around uh, a point or vector x, okay, f of x plus h is going to be approximately f of x plus the gradient at x del f of x dot dot product with this vector h. Okay, so again, this is an approximation. And then I have this error term that makes my uh, makes this an equality, not an inequality. Okay. Um, now this, let's kind of draw an analog here, or, you know, let's kind of consider the analog to the single variable case. Okay, we have f of x plus h equals f of x plus f prime of x times h. Okay, and so we have a first derivative. Uh, what if I want to add in the second derivative Okay, f double prime of x. Uh, what, I want, what if I want to add in the second derivative term? Okay, for single variable case, it looks like this. What does it look like for multivariable? What, uh, what, this, what does that second derivative look like? First of all, let's, let's kind of clear up some terminology, right? Um, in multivariable case, we don't have just derivatives, we have partial derivatives, right? Or, and directional derivatives, but right now we're concerned, concerned with partial derivatives. So um, the terminology, the correct phraseology, um, we call these, these first, uh, these derivatives with respect to our components, um, we call them first order partial derivatives or just for, first order partials. So I have, for a function f of x and y, I have partials in the x direction, f sub x and f sub y, right? And then I have my second order partials. Now I have a bunch of these, right? So kind of reconstructing again. Um, I have, if I differentiate in the x direction twice, I have f, x, x. And if I differentiate in the x direction and then the y direction, what do I have? I have f, x, y. On the other hand, I could have started with the y direction and then gone x. And I could also do f, y, y. Okay. And remember, again, in pretty much everything we're going to see in this class, these two things are equal. These, uh, if I change the order of my differentiation for my mixed partials, they're almost always going to be the same. All right, so I've kind of uh, naturally arranged these in this neat little, these neat rows. And if I just kind of throw some bars on the side, we could call this a matrix. And um, this is exactly what our second order, uh, our, excuse me, our second derivative term is gonna look like. This is basically what's gonna go in this blank here. Okay, so a bit more complicated than this just second, uh, second derivative for the single variable case. But we can use some notation to kind of make it uh, a bit quicker, okay? Um, so this is, we, we have this matrix because we can take second derivatives in a bunch of directions, right? And this is not, some, not just something for two variables. Uh, the, what I'm showing you, it kind of goes for 
multi many you know any kind of arbitrary dimension so if i had a function of fx well, let's say x1 to xn all right i'd have my gradient f of x okay um that would be what f x1 all the way to f x n and then what would that matrix of second order partial derivatives look like it it's it'd still be a matrix of second order partials to be like fx1 x1 fx1 x2 fx1 to xn and then similar fxn x1 to fxn xn it would just be a bigger matrix you don't have to worry about this i'm just mentioning that for completeness um now we have a little notation instead of like drawing a writing a matrix out like this every time we have a little notation that we could use um we represent this matrix of second derivatives uh with this notation here del squared okay so del is kind of like our derivative operator for um, multivariable functions and then we have the squared here meaning okay we're not just taking the first derivatives we're taking second derivatives Okay, so del squared of f, that's the matrix of second order partial derivatives. Okay, so now we have the notation we need to kind of plug something in here. Okay, and don't, I'm, I really don't want you guys to get hung up on this. I'm just explaining why the formula we're going to see in a little bit works. Okay, so I don't expect you guys to be able to reproduce this. Um, I think if you can follow along, it will give you a little bit of intuition. But don't worry about seeing this on um, tests or anything. So continuing with our little explanation, I rewrite my approximation and I add my second derivative term. Okay, so I have f of x plus h is equal to f of x plus the gradient of f of, uh, of f at x dot h plus that second derivative term. Okay, so let's again, kind of write our single variable case above it so we can draw some parallels. Okay. And then here I'm encountering my second derivative term. Okay, now I have my matrix of second derivatives. And if you've seen matrix multiplication, matrix times a vector, that's what's happening here. And then there's a dot product in here. Again, don't worry about it. Basically, what this is saying is we're multiplying a second derivative times our vector h. And then again, I have an error term that goes to zero as uh, well. The 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 limit of a to x over h squared goes to zero. So this this term goes to zero. Okay. So that error gets small as we get closer to x. Now again, let's assume we have the situation. Let's look at this and let's assume we have the situation where we're at a we're at a point A. And let's say that A is a critical value, meaning our gradient is a zero, is the zero vector. And let's also assume that um, this matrix of second derivatives is something we call positive definite. Okay, and again, don't worry about reproducing this. What does positive definite mean? Okay, it's, it's the problem here is that, you know, for the single variable case, what we would require is that the second derivative is positive. But it doesn't really make sense to say a matrix is positive or negative. So, but what we can say is, is that it's positive definite, meaning if I plug any vector h into this um, this operation here it's going to spit out a positive number okay so it doesn't matter what h is for this uh, for this uh, matrix um, the result is going to be a positive number that's what this positive definite means Okay, so this is the, that, that's the setup. We have uh, a critical point at A, 
and then the second derivative there uh, is positive definite. Okay, so now let's again kind of trace, let's kind of rewrite um, this line up here given these conditions. Okay, I rewrite, uh, instead of x's, I'm gonna write a's now. Okay, so I have f of a plus h is equal to f of a. Okay, so I just have this. And then my first derivative there is gonna be, well, my, my gradient is the zero vector. So when I take the dot product of the zero vector with any vector, that's just gonna give me the number zero, right? So I get the number zero here. And then we said this, this matrix is positive definite. So no matter what H I plug in, I'm getting a positive number. Okay. And then again, I have a small error term coming from this A to X H squared. And then again, um, let's translate this into what we're, what we're saying. Essentially what we're saying is F of A plus H is equal to F of A plus a positive number because uh, these two things combined will still be positive. Okay. In other words, what's, what's bigger? This F of A plus H is bigger because it's equal to F of A plus some positive number. And that's true for any, any point kind of close enough to A. So we see that if we have this setup where A is a critical point and this matrix has this property where we call it positive definite, then we're going to have uh, a what? A minimum value, okay? So F of A plus H is greater than F of A for any kind of point close enough to A which means this A is a, a minimum value, right? So, so if our gradient is zero and our second derivative is positive definite, um, A will be, uh, there will be a minimum at A. At our point A, okay? And that's, that's a, uh, if you look at the textbook, um, we're building up to what the text, the textbook kind of gives a, a clear formula about what this is. And it doesn't really explain where, it, it gives maybe some some little proof that seems to come out of nowhere. So I'm trying to show you where this idea comes from. Okay. So you might be feeling that this is too technical and why do we care? Well, the setup we've just shown, um, this can be applied to any, any dimension. Okay, not just two dimensions, could be applied to three dimensions, four dimensions and so on. There's nothing in here about two dimensions, right? The textbook works specifically for two dimensions. So what I've shown you is more general. But it also, I think, gives a bit more intuition on why the criteria I'm about to show you works. Okay, so now let's kind of get to the criteria that the book gives. Okay, so let's say I have this function r2 to r, and that's uh, pretty much all we're going to be concerned with in this um, section. Uh, they don't ask for this stuff in the in the higher dimensions. Let's say um, I have that function from R2 to R, okay. Uh, how can we define, let's be specific about, about what this positive definite thing is in this two dimensions. Well, it turns out if I look at my, my matrix of second derivatives, if this thing is positive and then the determinant is greater than zero, I'm gonna have uh, a minimum. Okay, and remember what determinant is. We saw the determinant and you, you know how to do it in the cross product case, right? If I, had, uh, if I was doing the cross product of two vectors, okay, maybe like two, one, four, and three, zero, six. Okay, how did we take the cross product? We kind of eliminated those first and then we did what? This times this minus this times this. Okay, and this, this thing here, okay, where I'm multiplying uh, diagonally and then subtracting, that's the determinant, okay? So essentially what we're doing is we're finding the determinant of this little two by two block, 
Okay. So do the same thing for the uh, matrix of second derivatives. Do this times this minus this times this. Okay. And what, what does that give you? All right, uh, that determinant So let's look at this matrix. The determinant of this thing, which we usually write as DET of you know, a matrix. What is the determinant of this thing? Well, let's compute it real quick, at least symbolically. It's FXX, FYY, minus what? FXY times FYX. And remember, for our differentiable functions, these are the exact same thing. So I could just write it as FXY squared, okay? Well, it turns out that if this thing is positive and then this determinant is greater than zero, our matrix is gonna be that positive definite thing I talked about above. So when we have these two criteria, okay, all right. And this is where uh, we're getting our, our second derivative test. Okay, and uh, on the other hand, by a similar reasoning, we can say, okay, when um, fxx is less than zero and that determinant is greater than zero, our matrix is gonna be negative definite. And so we'll have a maximum. Okay, so this is where the criteria of the, uh, and um, this is where the criteria from, for the book comes from. Okay, it's this idea of positive definite, negative definite, even if they don't say it. So let's go ahead and state what the criteria is. This is, and this is what the book tells you. They don't tell anything above here. The book kind of just gives you this set of rules. And they say, okay, look at, the, look at the matrix of second derivatives. If this is greater than zero and the determinant is greater than zero, then we're gonna have a, an, um, or have a local minimum. Okay, again, at, this is four critical points, four critical points. So for points where the gradient is already zero. All right, if this term here, this FXX, if this is less than zero, but the determinant is greater than zero, then we're gonna have a local maximum because our matrix will be negative definite. And then if, um, if the determinant is, uh, so if that determinant is less than zero, it doesn't matter what's going on with the first derivative, um, we're going to have a saddle point. So one of those points where we have neither a maximum nor a minimum. And then don't worry about the case where the determinant is equal to zero. So I've given you a bunch of information and maybe, you know, I don't know how much you guys followed, hopefully all of it, but maybe not. Uh, if you're a little confused and you just want a list of steps, okay, I'm going to give that to you now. Okay, so let's recap. So, for a function of two variables, which is all we're gonna be concerned with in this section, uh, let's assume that this function has continuous second order partial derivatives. All right, so this is kind of like the, the criteria, uh, the, the first assumption we're making. And usually you're, you're not gonna be asked to show that or anything, that's just kind of background. Yeah. Let's talk about the steps to find local minimum, local maximum. First thing I wanna do, step one, 
calculate the gradient f of x. Uh, and this, this will be just in the general form where everything's still in terms of x's and y's. Step two, determine the points where that gradient is going to be equal to the zero vector. So in other words, the critical points. Find the critical points of our function. Uh, so it looks like I gave some example here. Um, did I give an example of finding the critical? I think I did, right? Didn't we talk about, excuse me for just a moment. Yeah, we talked about finding the critical points already. All right, so. Uh, so determine the, where the critical points occur. All right. Now we're going to test, uh, we're going to look at these critical points. We're going to look at the critical points and, uh, test them using our, our second derivative test. We're going to test them to determine whether they're maximums, minimums, or neither. How do we do that? Step three. First, we're going to calculate that matrix of second order partial derivatives, okay? Oh, uh, and I think, yeah, it doesn't matter. So let's say I have, let's say I have some function f of x and y, okay? Uh, and it, let's, let's not, let's just say, let's leave it blank. But then let's say, okay, let's assume I found its gradient and its gradient is equal to this, x squared minus one, uh, comma y. Okay, so that would be what finding that gradient is step two. Oh, and I think that's what I did up here. Let's say let's say the gradient I found up here is. Um, let's say I found the gradient of f is equal to x squared minus one, y. Where is this thing equal to zero? How do I solve for when this is equal to zero? Well, let's see. I require x squared minus one equal to zero, right? This has two solutions. x equals positive one, x equals negative one. And then I require y equals zero, okay? So what are my critical points? Well, one of them would be positive one, zero, and one of them would be negative one, zero. So those are my critical points, okay? All right, step three. Uh, I've found my critical points. I need to test them to determine whether the maximums and minimums how do I continue forward? Uh, step three would be to find the matrix of second derivatives. So I have my function f x y, and let's not talk about what that is. Its gradient we said is equal to this x squared minus one comma y. Now I find its matrix of um, second derivatives, uh, second order partial derivatives. So what's the f x x? Well, that would be two x. What's fxy, excuse me, fxy, that'd be zero. What's fyx, again, zero. And what's fyy, one. Okay, so this is my matrix of um, second order partial derivatives. And once I have this, I'm not really concerned with the general case where I have x's and y's in my matrix. I wanna, I wanna test my critical points, meaning I wanna plug my critical points into this matrix. And we usually test these critical points one at a time. So let's say I plug the point um, one, zero into my matrix. What, what point do I get? Well, X is equal to one. And then there's no Y's in here, so it doesn't really, even really matter what Y is. But for uh, this point one comma zero, our, our matrix of second derivatives looks like this, two, zero, zero, one. Next step, we're gonna take, I'm gonna take this, um, this matrix with the constants in it, and I'm gonna calculate the determinant, okay? So what's the determinant of this matrix here? Well, it'd be two times one minus zero times zero, so that determinant is equal to two. And if you prefer to memorize this formula for the determinant, that's fine. If not, just use the general kind of cross multiplication thing. All right. So now I have all of my information, right? I have, 
I know what my FXX is and I know what my determinant is. So now I can classify based on my three rules, which I've copied and pasted here. Okay, so I have my three rules. Now, which case is this matrix here? Okay, well, I have FXX is greater than zero. And is my determinant greater than zero? Yes. So that means I that this point one comma zero, so one comma zero is a local minimum. Okay. And I guess I should put that down here. So to conclude, one comma zero, well, I guess the proper way to say it is a local minimum occurs at point one comma zero. But we had two critical points, right? Okay. What was, the, what was my other critical point? One of them was one comma zero. The other one was negative one comma zero. So when I plug negative one comma zero into my matrix of second derivatives, what do I get? I get negative two, zero, zero, one. Okay. And now what's the determinant of this matrix? It's negative two. Okay. So what do I have? I have fxx is negative and the determinant's negative. Well, which case is that? Well, let's see. It's not this case. It's not this case. Well, it's this case. So it, it looks like at that point, I have a saddle point. I have um, one of these points uh, that's neither positive nor negative, or excuse me, neither a positive, uh, neither a maximum nor a minimum. So it's a saddle point at negative one, zero. Okay. Now let's try uh, an example from scratch following our criteria. We kind of did one starting halfway through. Let's do another example. So let's start with this function here fxy equals x squared plus xy plus y squared plus y. Let's uh, find any local minimums and maximums. Okay, so what's my step one? Step one is to find our gradient. Boom. So that's my gradient. And now step two is finding my critical points. And in some of these cases, that can be kind of difficult, right? So I'm for my, uh, and again, this is kind of coming into the area where I've done some work on my previous run through on the video. So to find my critical points, what do I need? I need this to be equal to zero and I need this thing to be equal to zero. Okay, so I need two X plus Y to equal zero. And then I need X plus two Y plus one equals zero. But we can rephrase this second thing instead of saying x plus 2y plus 1 equals 0, let's say x plus 2y equals negative 1. I'm just moving that 1 over to the other side. And then once I've done this, this is a, a system of equations, okay? And maybe you remember how to solve them, maybe you don't. Basically, what I want to do is I want to multiply these equations by some constants and then add them vertically to kind of eliminate one term. So how would I do that in this case? I wanna multiply this whole thing by negative two, this bottom equation. And when I do that, what do I get? I get negative two X minus four Y equals positive two. That's what my second equation becomes. Okay, nothing's really changed. I've just multiplied by a constant. And then if I add these equations ver vertically, let's see what happens. Well, two X cancels with negative two X. Y minus four Y equals negative three Y equals two, okay? In other words, y equals negative two thirds. And then if I take that value of y and I plug it into, let's say this top equation, you can plug it into either one. Well, that tells me what x is. I have two x minus two thirds equals zero. So it must be that x is equal to one third. Okay. 
So these, that's my critical point then. X equals one third, Y equals negative two thirds. That's my critical point. So that's my only possibility for a local min or local max. So now uh, my further, my future steps are just uh, about determining which one, if either of those is the case. Okay, so what do I do? I find the matrix of second derivatives, second order partials. So that's my, remember that's my gradient. What's my, my, what's my second derivative? Uh, what's fxx? Well, that would be two. Okay, so two goes in my top left corner. What's fxy? So I take this, I differentiate with respect to y. Well, that's gonna be one. Okay, so a one goes there. Then let's say I did fy and let's, okay, so this is my fy. What's the derivative of this thing with respect to x? It's just one. And then differentiating this with respect to y, I have two. Okay. So this is my matrix of uh, second order partial derivatives. This is my second derivative term. Okay. Uh, now there's no, you know, uh, on if there were x's and y's involved here, I would plug the x's and y's from my critical point in into this thing. But there's no x's or y's, so it's just I just leave it as this matrix of constants. Step four, calculate your determinant of your matrix. Okay, so what's the determinant of this thing? It's this times this minus this times this. So it's four minus one. So my derivative is equal to three. Okay, so let's see, my fxx is two, that's greater than zero. My uh, determinant is three, that's also greater than zero. So classifying, I have this case, fxx is greater than zero, my determinant is greater than zero. Okay, so what does my, what does my uh, table of rules tell me? It tells me I have a local minimum at this critical point at one, th one third comma negative two thirds. Okay, so I have a, uh, I have a minimum, at, excuse me, I have a local minimum at that point. All right, so that about covers local mins and local maxes. Now let's revisit the issue of um, absolute mins and absolute maxes. So remember for the single variable case, um, this, that second derivative test only worked on the inside of my domain, right? It didn't work at my endpoints of my bounded interval. An example of that would be this function x squared. Let me kind of erase my doodles here. So let's consider this function x squared. Um, not everywhere, let's say it's confined to this interval, negative one to one. Okay, what does that graph look like? Well, it's already right here, all right? Now we see this point at the origin, that's a local minimum, right? It's, it's kind of the, the bottom of our valley and it's on the inside of our domain, uh, on the interior of our interval. So if I use my second derivative test method, okay, I'm gonna find out that that's a critical point. You know, I, I find the first derivative, which is two X, where's two X equal to zero at X equals zero. So I see X equals zero is a critical point. And then I use my second derivative test to kind of classify that point. And I see that, okay, the second derivative is gonna be positive there. So that point is a minimum. Okay, that's all well and good. What about maximums? Okay, well, there's no local maximums and if I, uh, I can I can see that just by saying okay well this is the only critical point I found right so any other local mins or local maxes also have to be a critical points so since there's no other critical points there's no other local mins or local maxes but these points here are definitely the maximums on these uh, are definitely at the maximum of this function on this interval. Okay, so, but they're, since they're occurring at the endpoints, you know, our, our second derivative test method doesn't really work for these, okay? So how can we, uh, if, I don't know what a, if, if I don't know what the graph of a function looks like, how can I determine, you know, whether or not these endpoints are uh, maxes or mins? And how, can I, how can I find for sure the absolute maximum?
So there's a, a way to go about this. And it's basically just testing the endpoints individually. <clears throat> and we have a, a similar idea for the multivariable case, which I'll go into more detail when we, um, in, a, in a moment. Um, but just a little background, we also have uh, this problem of working on endpoints. But for our higher dimensions, it's not as simple as just uh, you know, two endpoints. We have this um, whole curve we have to consider. Okay. So let's, let's look at a multivariable function. Let's look at this multivariable function. F of x, y equals four minus x squared minus y squared. And we're not gonna consider it everywhere on R2. Let's restrict ourselves to this domain here um, where x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to four. Okay. So what does this thing look like? Well, if you remember your 12.5 material, you, you're gonna see that this is a, what do we call it? An elliptic paraboloid, I believe. It's basically a, a downward facing um, bell shape. Okay, and since, since we're only considering it on this domain where x squared, is, x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to four, we kind of get this thing that's chopped off. Okay, it doesn't go down forever, it stops right here. All right, so it's kind of this, this little upside down bell that's kind of laying on the ground. All right. Now, clearly, at this point here, we have a maximum, and it's even going to be a local maximum, right? It's, you know, we could draw a little, uh, well, let's see. When we're considering local maxes and mins, we're, we're really considering a little circle around the input, right? This, this point here on our graph is coming from this, this input down here, okay? So if I draw a little circle around this input, there's, you know, for any other inputs in this little circle, you know, they would end up kind of around here. They're gonna be lower than this, this yellow point up here, okay? So that's, that's how we kind of determine that this is a local maximum. So clearly, as I said, you know, this is a this is a local maximum. Okay. That's all well and good if if we had um, used our our uh, steps that we outlined above, our kind of second derivative test thing, we would have discovered that well, this is a critical point in here. That's a critical point, and we would have then classified it and used our second derivative test and seen okay, yeah, there's going to be a maximum at this point which is, you know, this is the maximum value up here, okay? All right, so that's all well and good. But then that's the only critical point we find for this function, right? Um, that's the only time, uh, our, our gradient is gonna be equal to zero. Why is that? What is our gradient of this function? Um, Our gradient is what negative two x, negative two y. So this thing's only equal to zero zero when x and y are both equal to zero. So this point here, the origin, is my only critical point. Okay. So this this green boundary, this green this green circle, which is exactly the boundary of my domain, right? My domain is x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to four. So my, my, my domain is this circle with radius two, right? This green line is my boundary. And clearly at the boundary, we have minimum values. Those are uh, this, uh, there's an absolute uh, minimum occurring at, on, on this boundary. Okay. So again, we see some sort of breakdown of the, uh, minimum and maximum on the boundary, okay? Our second derivative test gives us our local maximum, but it doesn't give us this uh, information on the boundary. So how do, we, how do we deal with this when we have a boundary we need to consider? Okay, when we're, when we're looking for absolute value, uh, abs excuse me, absolute maximums and absolute minimums, okay? So what we do is we find the local maxes and mins inside of our domain 
using our, our uh, kind of second derivative test method, if you want to call it that. So I consider all the points inside my boundary, okay? Everything inside the green circle, okay? I use my second derivative test method on here. I find all my critical points and test them, and that gives me information on the inside of my circle. All right, so I find all those maxes and mins. Step two, I'm gonna look at the boundary. I'm gonna look at the boundary by itself. So for this case, I would look at my green line, my green circle. I'm gonna consider that boundary by itself. And then I'm gonna find the maxes and mins on the boundary. And this can be kind of complicated. Um, and usually what we have, these steps will make more sense after our next example. But usually how we do this is, okay, maybe our boundary can be broken down into pieces. Okay, so 2a, we break our boundary down into some simple pieces. And then we try and write those pieces as functions of a single variable. Uh, so like I try, like if I have my boundary in terms of x and y, I try and kind of eliminate one of my variables and just write it as a function of x. Okay, and then once I do that, I basically will just have a, a function of a single variable and I can use my calc1 methods uh, to find uh, maxes and mins on that boundary. All right, and when you do all those steps, you're gonna find the maxes and mins on your boundary. And then what you do is you compare the maxes and mins on the boundary with the stuff inside. And then you see, all right, what's actually the biggest. And then you call that your absolute max or absolute min. Okay. So for like the single variable case, this is kind of, uh, this is kind of a simple example of how this process works. So you have this, this graph with endpoints, right? And clearly we can see absolute maxes and mins, but a lot of times we're not gonna be able to tell what the graph looks like beforehand, okay? So let's say we have some function, I need to figure out where absolute maxes and mins are. I do the second derivative test stuff on the inside of this interval, and that's gonna give me all my local mins, local maxes. Then I test the out the boundary individually uh, in this in this single variable case that just means testing endpoints and I see I have a certain value here and a certain value here and then I compare all these values and I say well okay out of all my max out of all my values what's my maximum okay so I would consider this this and this right well clearly this thing is the absolute maximum so I call that my absolute maximum and then I for my, uh, to find my absolute minimum, again, what do I consider? I consider my endpoints and I consider my local minimums. Okay, so what's the absolute minimum out of all these? Well, between these two, it's a little close, but it's this one, right? So let's see a, cl a quick and partial example of, um, How this would work. So what I'm going to do, there's a bunch of work here um, that I'm not going to try and erase all right now. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy and paste this problem onto a new page. Okay. So this is the example problem and this is a long one so we're only going to, we're not going to go all the way through but hopefully it will be not to see how this works. It is a lengthy process, okay? And this absolute max and min stuff is kind of a lengthy process depending on the case, right? So let's say we're given the function of x and y, x squared plus y squared minus two x on the closed triangular region with these vertices, two comma zero, zero comma two, zero comma negative two. Okay, so that's a lot of fancy words. What does that mean? So, uh, I have a multivariable function, and its domain is what? This is, remember, this is my x axis, y axis, z axis. Okay, so what is that domain? It's the triangle with these points. Okay, so the point two comma zero, where is that? That'd be like here. Where is zero comma two? That would be here. And then where's zero negative two? That's here. Okay, 
So this is our domain, that's our region. All right, so inside the domain, this, so inside the shaded region, I can use my second derivative test kind of method. Okay, so how do I, what, how do I find the local mins and max inside that region? I find my first step, find my, so let's kind of label this stuff, local min max. So step one, find your gradient. What's your gradient? Uh, 2x minus 2. Let's see, maybe if I re start that. Okay, so my gradient is what? What do we say? 2x minus 2. Yep. Uh, what's, and then 2y. So that's my gradient. Step two, find your critical points. So where is my gradient equal to the zero vector? Well, let's see. That first component is only equal to zero when x equals one and y equals zero. So it looks like the critical point inside is just one comma zero, which would be kind of, where would that be? It'd be like right here, right? So the, that's the critical point inside. Okay. All right, so that's my critical point. I don't know whether it's max or min. So step three, uh, what is step three? Finding our matrix of second derivatives. Okay, what is that? Um, two, zero, zero, two, all right? Okay, let me look at the steps. Oh, well, I was gonna look at the steps to make sure I'm being consistent with what I told you before, but let's just go, go through, I'll just do it by memory. If I forget some, if my steps don't match quite what I told you, I apologize, but you should get the general idea. Okay, so that's our matrix of second derivatives. I think this is matching up. Okay, uh, step four. Uh, let's. I if oh, if I'm correct about what that is, it's finding the determinant, right? What's the determinant of our matrix? Okay, well, what's the determinant of this thing, which is just what um, equal to four minus zero, which is equal to four. Okay. Step five, classify. Okay, so um, let's see, our fxx is two, and then, so that's greater than zero, and then our determinant is greater than zero. So we have a local minimum at point one zero. Okay, so this point here inside our domain, there's like a, a local minimum there. Great. So I found all my local mins and maxes. Since there's only one critical point, there can't be any other, you know, local mins or maxes inside my uh, interval. Excuse me, inside my region. All right. Now I need to look at the boundary. Okay. So, and this is kind of maybe this is where the um, steps will, for the second part will start making sense. I have my boundary, it's kind of made up of these three lines, right? So when I say break the boundary up into pieces, I mean, let's consider each of these three pieces separately. So let's consider this piece first, okay? And let's kind of draw it uh, in the X, Y plane. Let's forget about the uh, Z coordinate real quick. Uh, that curve in the X, Y plane um, and let's kind of re reorient our axes a little bit. That's this line that starts, uh, well, it doesn't really matter where it starts and ends, but it's got endpoints two comma zero and zero comma two. Okay, now how can I write this line? Um, this, you know, let's write it in y equals mx plus b form. This line would be what? y equals negative x plus two, 
All right. And this is for the X value between zero and two. Okay. All right. So we've now written this line as a function uh, I've, I've got an equation for that boundary piece. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my function fxy, my original function, and I'm trying to find the, um, max, local max, or absolute maxes and mins of. I'm gonna plug that into my function. So what is my function? x squared plus y squared minus two x minus two x. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna replace y with this thing. So on the boundary, my function becomes this. Okay. And then let's just square this out and simplify. Let's see, we get x squared plus x squared minus 4x plus 4 minus 2x. So if I've done this correctly, we have this. Okay. So I've kind of eliminated one variable and now I've, I've writ, rewritten this function of fx, uh, this function of f of x and y. Now it's just a function of a single variable, right? So now I can use my calc one stuff to find uh, my maximum and minimum, okay? Uh, along, along the boundary. So along, along this line here, you know, maybe my curve looks like this along that line. Uh, but I, it, if I kind of consider this slice, it, well, it's kind of like it's a function of a single variable, okay? So I'm gonna use my calc one stuff, okay? So how do I do maximums and minimums in calc one? Okay, I find f prime. Is, that's equal to four X minus six. I find my critical points, where's, F prime equal to zero. It equals zero at six over four, which is equal to what? Three over two. All right, now I test that um, critical point. That that critical point is, let's see, we're, we're working on the domain now we're working on the domain X is between zero and two. Three over two is inside there. All right, now I uh, do my second derivative test. So what's my second derivative? Well, that's equal to four. So I have at three over two, my first derivative is zero. My second derivative is positive. So I have a minimum minimum at the point x equals three over two. And if x equals three over two, what is y? Uh, y is gonna be equal to one over two. So on that boundary, on at this point, three over two, one over two on my boundary, I have a minimum point, okay? So that means I have, um, what did we say? We have a minimum point right here at one comma zero inside my boundary at three over two, one over two, which is let's say right here, I have a minimum point and, uh, for my boundary, I was testing this line. Remember, like I did my calc one stuff and that only tells me about the stuff inside the line. What about the endpoints of the line? I need to test those individually. Okay. So let's see. First of all, what is the function value of this point? Let's plug our three over two, one over two into our function 
And what do we get? Um, nine over four plus one over four, 10 over four minus six over two, 12 over four. Negative one half, I believe. Okay, so at this point, our functional value is negative one half. What about at the end point of our boundary, which is, let's check two comma zero. Okay, f of two zero, what is that? So I plug two zero into my function. Uh, what's my function? I plug in two zero, I get zero. And what about zero comma two? I should get four. Okay. So let's see. On the boundary, I have points. I have this negative, this local minimum inside the bound, or let's see, kind of on the boundary. And then at the endpoints of that piece of the boundary, I have these values. So out of these three, negative one over two is the minimum, right? But this point inside our boundary, for this point inside our boundary, uh, one comma zero, what's the value there? I plug one comma zero into my function and I get negative two. So this, this point is still the minimum so far. Okay, so what have I considered? I've, I found my minimum in the boundary and I found, you know, I've considered this piece of the boundary. Now I need to do the same thing, but I need to consider this piece of the boundary and this piece of the boundary. All right, so it's a lot of work, obviously, but that's the general uh, steps you take to complete it. Hopefully there aren't any or aren't too many of these types of problems on your homework, but I at least wanted to show you. All right, a long video, so you can imagine how frustrated I was to record this again. Uh, apologies for the delay. Okay, let me go to Zoom. Goodbye.